Sway in the Morning, Shade 4-5, man. We got the 109th mayor of New York City here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, he's been fighting hard to make uh, this beautiful city of New York uh, just a better place to live and to improve the quality of life uh, to help us come to some type of um, if some type of agreement on our differences. We all we all have different political points of views, how how our everyday life should be handled, how immigrants should be handled coming into this city, how. Um, how uh, Rikers Island should be handled, all, all these different questions that are up. I watch the mayor all the time on New York One, I think it is. There you go. Yeah, and um, and I see you filled a lot of tough questions. And, you know, for a long time we've been wanting to have you come up here and talk to our citizens. Though we broadcast out of New York City, Heather B., would you tell the mayor how far our reach actually goes? We have 32 million subscribers here at Sirius XM wow. from New Jersey. That's where I'm from. Okay. Yeah, I know okay. <laughs> okay. From New Jersey. I was going to say, they're not all from New Jersey. <laughs> they're, they're not all from New Jersey. Uh, from New Jersey to, we have callers come calling in from Africa. Wow. Um, yeah, Mexico, Africa, Canada. Uh, so many. Our reach here is huge, and we're excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming through saying Sway in the Morning. Give wow. it up for Mayor Bill de Blasio, Thank ladies and gentlemen. I gotta start with the tough questions first, bro. <laughs> All right, Sway, I'm ready. Born and raised here, right? Born here, raised right. in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yes, sir. So, where did you go to grade school? I went to grade school in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, public Massachusetts. schools all the way. In fact, I went to the high school there, Cambridge Ridge and Latin. Two years behind me uh -huh. was a guy who ruined my reputation as the tallest guy in class. Patrick Ewing went Patrick to Ewing. my <laughs> high school. Okay, and I was, you know, I just wasn't the same after he walked down the hallway the first time. So, okay, lost all my cred. Lost all your cred. Yeah. Plus, you couldn't dunk. I heard you wasn't much of a. Well, I had other skills. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, um, this is New York City. The birthplace of hip hop. Who are your favorite? Um, who's your top three rappers um, out of New York City? Mm. Oh wow! <laughs> you didn't get me ready for that. Nah, man. I think about that. Think about. I, know, I think that. I can tell you who I like in general, even if okay. they're not out of New York City. Go for it. Go for it. I like SZA. SZA. Okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> should, like should we reveal TDE SZA? SZA. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, like, I'm open about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, you wouldn't call St. Beauty rap. Uh huh. Okay. I love St. Beauty. Okay. But I wouldn't call them rap. What, would you, what genre would you call them? Whoa. Well, I'm going to focus mm -hmm. on, you know, you got Notorious B.I.G. Yes. Oh, you mean historical. Yeah, yeah, historical. Jay-Z's here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a lot of... Most deaf. Mo okay, there you go. That's yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. What do your kids listen to? Oh, my God. They listen. So, a lot of, lot of Wu-Tang, a lot of, lot of <laughs> wow. focus there. Now, they're, you know, they're 20 and 23. Yeah. Uh -huh. But they have the big sweep of history. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... They want they want to get the the single album from Wu Tang. They want to get it from Martin Shrekley. Okay. Yeah, that's goal in life. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they want to get it and give it to the world. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Okay, man. De Blasio, man. He knows some hip hop and knows yeah. some music culture, man. Yes. I ain't yes. mad at that. We're here to talk about you and the Shaolin. City. Shaolin. Shaolin. You know about yeah. Burrow. Shaolin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> You're sweating right there, man. You yeah. good? That's why you got all those facts right so when you okay. can't see and, this. And, well, i got to tell you one more thing. Hip yeah. hop, born in New York City. Just want to make sure if anyone's listening on the West Coast. Yes. The Bronx. The Bronx. Born in the Bronx. Grandmaster yeah. Flash. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. If anyone else has any illusions. <laughs> yeah. Right here. <laughs> you said tripping, hey. Mayor de Blasio? <laughs> like, you said tripping right now. I also, I also use one important rap line when people feel in my <clears throat> office at City Hall, when they're kind of upset that something happened, I try and be the realistic one in the room. Mm -hmm. I say, these are the breaks. I quote Curtis, Curtis Blow. Blow. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Okay. Yeah. You pull that up, Multi-generational. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the headlines read, Mayor de Blasio and City Council reach agreement to replace Rikers Island yes. jails with uh, community-based facilities. And uh, I wanted to ask you because I, I've, I've been watching and, and, you know, i got a few people um, in my family who work in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Right? And um, over the weekend, there was a CO, a CO that was assaulted by an inmate mm -hmm. at Rikers Island. Um the officer suffered a broken nose. He had burns. This is the fourth attack, I believe, on the officer since mid-February. The correction officer's uh, Benevolent Association president said, uh, complained about the violence at Rikers Islands has increased since de Blasio initiated reforms restricting how inmates are punished for bad behavior while in jail. 
such as ending punitive segregation for inmates 21 years old and under. He also had this to say. In all honesty, I have members who are afraid. I don't think that he has a healthy respect for law and order. Well, how do you respond to that? I got to put the headphones on so you can hear the clip. Did you hear the clip? I did hear it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's absolutely inappropriate and unfair for him to say that. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think it smacks of the kind of language we've heard for decades whenever people attempt reform. Someone likes to wheel out, oh, they're against law and order, especially if they happen to be from a law enforcement union. Uh-huh. Uh, they like to use that language. Couldn't be further from the truth. Uh-huh. You're talking about law and order in New York City. We're the safest big city in America. Crime has gone down four years in a row because we turned away from uh, forceful strategies like stop and frisk that divided police and community. We uh-huh. created a neighborhood policing philosophy. Well, let's take it over to Rikers and the correction system. In fact, the... Assaults on our officers are absolutely unacceptable. We do everything we can to fight them. We want to do more to fight them, but they're down compared to other previous years. Uh That's the fact. And um, the notion that that the union representing those officers wants us to go back to solitary confinement or punitive segregation. Well, we all were gripped and pained by the story of Khalif Browder. And one of the (coughs) absolutely worst things that happened to Khalif Browder in a addition to being kept in jail for a ridiculous amount of time, an unfair amount of time, was he was put in solitary. Uh That's what broke him down emotionally and mentally. And uh, no young people should go through that. We've said no one goes into solitary confinement uh, up to the age of 21 Uh in our correction system. Uh It is counterproductive. It's destructive to the human soul. It does not aid in rehabilitation. We have other methods we use to isolate and to punish uh, inmates, if they attack an officer or another inmate, what and are to those charge f- them. For example, additional charges. Okay. More time in jail, more time in prison. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And that's a big deal. Um, but we have to show that we mean that. And our new DA up in the Bronx, Darcel Clark, has done a much better job uh, than was true in the past of making those charges stick and yeah. showing there's those consequences. We're going to do other things to take away um, some other things that inmates want to show them we won't tolerate that behavior. But to go to punitive segregation, is a step in the wrong direction. And again, I'm sick of conservative voices that say more punishment is the only way. I mean, yeah. We're supposed to be about rehabilitation. We're supposed to be about redemption. You put someone in solitary confinement, you turn them negative. You turn them into a more violent person, not a less violent person. Well, what would the charges mm-hmm. do if you stack more charges on a, on a sentence? I was, that's still a form of punishment. Well, it is, but it's a punishment specific to what they did. In other words, they get charged for the same uh, crime as if they had done it out on the street. So let's say someone's in there and they assault an officer, just like if they did another assault on the street, they would get an additional charge. Uh I think knowing you will do more time in prison because you did something wrong and you had due process is a lot more just than putting you into an inhumane circumstance. And again, we know... We know what solitary confinement does, particularly to younger people, and we know it has devastating long-term impacts. So why would we use that? Why? It's only going to make someone, in my view, uh-huh. more violent for the long term. It's not going to solve a problem. Mayor de Blasio is here, mayor of New York City. Um, you're going to replace Riker Island jails with community-based facilities. Um, how does this improve the condition? Like, what is the what is the hope yeah. behind the community based facilities? Well, the the most important thing to know is that we want to replace Rikers Island first and foremost by reducing the number of people in jail to begin with. Oh. I, you know, I would say that, uh, the era of mass incarceration did not begin in New York City, but it will end in New York City. We already have half as many people in jail as we had 20 years ago. Uh-huh. We're going to drive that down again. We're going to get down to as few as 5,000 people on any given day in a city of eight and a half million people. And then we don't need Rikers Island anymore. So we move to jails that are near the courthouses in each borough, Uh which means you don't have everyone traveling all over the place, but also for family members coming to visit, which is very important to people's rehabilitation. The families nearby. Rikers is very, very isolated. Yeah. We want it to be, God forbid you're in jail, at least your family members can get to you more easily. It's a central location in each borough. Uh-huh. Um, but look, the bottom line is to get off of Rikers Island, we have to keep digging down crime. What we learned in New York City was to get down crime, to reduce crime, it actually meant building a bond between police and community, starting an actual dialogue. Officers and community members know each other by first name. The officers now in New York City typically give their cell phone number, their email address to 
members of the community so they can mm. contact them directly and yeah. build a bond and actually get more help for the community. Um, it stops a lot of crime in advance. Here's a statistic that I think, to use the parlance of my youth, will blow your mind. Okay. That uh, <laughs> in 2017 in New York City, 100,000 fewer arrests than four years earlier. Wait, say that again? In 2017 in New York City, the NYPD arrested 100,000 fewer people than four years earlier, and crime went down at the same time. So what we're finding is in the past, there were way too many arrests. Yeah. And there wasn't a relationship and a dialogue between police and community. As we built that dialogue, it's actually helped officers to stop crime before it even happens in many cases. Mm -hmm. But also, we're not trying to arrest just for the sake of arrest. Mm -hmm. We're telling officers sometimes a warning is fine, sometimes a summons rather than arrest. What's happening now is when you bring down arrests, 100,000 fewer arrests, that means a lot fewer people going to Rikers, in many cases for very minor offenses that never should have put them into jail to begin with. Uh -huh. uh, Mayor de Blasio is here. Mm. A lot of those people are being arrested uh, for different reasons, for different crimes, some of them um, for opioid usage. Mm -hmm. And, and now they're in, they're in jail. We've seen this happen, and um, and I grew up in Oakland, and I moved to New York in 2000. But every I live in Harlem, you know. Um, we've seen this happen in minority communities. People get addicted to these yes. opioids, and and they're criminalized, and they're thrown in jail. Now we're starting to see it as an epidemic because it's gone mainstream and it's getting into other other communities yep. now. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Like, what happens to those who went to jail for opioid, opioid use now that it's being treated as an epidemic? Well, we got to go back and look at everything that was done in the past. Yeah. It's actually one of the very powerful things President Obama did before he left office was to, uh, you know, right a lot of those wrongs of the past with individual sentences. But we got to go back and anybody who was put into a longer sentence for minor drug use, you mm -hmm. know, that we have to rectify that. We don't have that power in the city, but it's something we could do on the state level and the national level, obviously. But on the opioid epidemic, you're absolutely right. This is one of the m most truly national phenomena that we've ever seen, sadly. It's, it's rural, it's urban, it's mm -hmm. every part of the country, it's wealthy people, it's low-income folks, it's everyone. So in the city, we have devoted a lot more resources to the things that actually break the cycle. It is about, first of all, not letting there be a stigma about addiction. Mm -hmm. Addiction, whether we like it or not, is part of the human condition. And my wife, Sherlane, has led an effort called Thrive NYC to, in every way, destigmatize substance misuse and mental health challenges. People have to come out in the open and talk about it. They have to ask for help. The people in their life, their loved ones, their, their friends have to be able to say, it's okay to need help. Uh -huh. And what we are doing now in New York City is you call a single number, it's 888-NYC-WELL. I'm gonna repeat it, 888-NYC-WELL. You get a trained counselor 24 seven, multiple languages. They will help you with whatever you're confronting. Let's say you have an opioid problem. They will help connect you right away to an appointment to get treatment. Uh -huh. It's not just, hey, here's a number, have a nice day. They literally stay on the phone, make sure you get the appointment. And if you want to come back and get additional help from them, you can keep that dialogue going. And the notion is once people acknowledge an opioid addiction, treatment's there. In this city, there's, there's enough treatment for everyone. Uh -huh. Um, we got to make sure people come out and deal with it because if they don't, you know, the danger of overdose is profound. Now, the other thing we've done is the, the reversal drug for an opioid overdose called naloxone. Every police officer on patrol has it. Every mm. firefighter, what does that every do? EMT. It, it literally, it's a spray, a nasal spray that can stop an overdose dead in its tracks, save a life. And then what we're doing now, we announced it this week, is anybody who goes through that kind of horrible situation where they're on the way to overdose and they get saved, we have peer counselors start to work with them in the hospital uh -huh. and work with their family and friends right away to make sure that there's follow through, that they get to treatment. You don't want to have someone save from an overdose one day and go right back to the same problem the next day because there was no attempt to intervene. So we take that crisis and we try and t turn it into a turning point uh -huh. where we get people connected to treatment. Okay, so my, 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 my homeboy from East Oakland that got through, through in jail for being addicted, can we, can we get him some um, legal help? Well, I'll, I'll, we, <laughs> we will certainly. So he could get I'll that work with you to get him legal help. Spray, yeah, know? because okay. it's, and one of the things is we're trying, this is one of the things the NYPD is doing. We're not trying to victimize the addict, yeah. the individual. We're trying to go at the dealer for sure, especially okay. because now 
Heroin laced with fentanyl is extraordinarily deadly. I mean, fentanyl is a bad game changer, and people need to understand that is not yesterday's heroin. What's yeah. out on the street now is exceedingly deadly. But we're not trying to go after the, the individual addict. That's a tragic situation that needs to be addressed with compassion and treatment. We're trying to go after the people who are actually moving the drugs around. What um, about the pharmaceutical companies? They are the root of all evil here. Yeah. And I am suing... Uh, the major opioid companies and distributors who started this epidemic. Look, we had heroin for a long time. We all know yeah, that. Yeah. Um, but what supercharged the opioid epidemic was the purposeful uh, profit-based uh, strategy of pushing prescription opioids out into the market in vast numbers. And you literally had these uh, pharmaceutical companies pushing doctors to prescribe a lot more painkillers at much higher doses for a much longer period of time so they could make money. Uh -huh. And it created the pathway to addiction for millions and millions of Americans. Then a lot of them switched to heroin. Now that heroin's laced with fentanyl. Uh -huh. But we have to understand, we were going along with a situation where, sure, there was, there was way too many people addicted on heroin to begin with, but they weren't dying in droves. Uh, what happened here is the big pharmaceutical companies hooked America on opioids uh -huh. as a purposeful profit-making strategy. That got a lot more people to then turn to heroin. So if you took that original sin out of the equation, we'd still have a problem, but we'd have nowhere near the problem we have right now. So we're suing those companies, and a lot of jurisdictions around the country are suing them, just like we did the big tobacco companies uh -huh. long ago. We think that's going to result in a lot of money coming back we can use to get people treatment. Okay, Mayor de Blasio is here, man. Oh, cute. He's a resident of New York City as well. Yeah, I actually grew up in the Bronx uh, in, in NYCHA housing. Uh, the home of hip-hop. Like hip Have yeah. I mentioned that? <laughs> Did I mention that? <laughs> and for those and of, salsa. Yeah, salsa. Salsa also yeah. comes from New York City. Thank you very much. But for those who are outside of New York City who may not know what NYCHA salsa. is, it stands for New York City Housing Authority. And yeah. I grew up in Butler Houses in the Bronx. Uh -huh. And speaking of NYCHA, it's been in the news lately because of all the, um, I guess, the deteriorating uh, situations that's happening with the yeah. boilers and, and whatnot. And I think uh, last week, uh, while you were out of town, Governor Cuomo came and he took a tour of uh, Jackson houses yeah. out there. And uh, this is what he had to say upon taking that tour. There are roaches, uh, the vermin, there are health safety issues, the paint is coming off the walls, the plaster is coming off the walls. It has nothing to do with the way the family has taken care of the unit. NYCHA is run by New York City. The state has zero role in the running of New York City Housing Authority. Uh, New York City Housing Authority has been so bad that the state has appropriated money to help NYCHA. So how do you feel about those comments of him seemingly, I guess, distancing himself from the, the problem and taking a tour while you were out of town? Look, I, I don't care about the personal piece of the equation. I care about the 400,000 people who live in public housing. Well, it, since I came into office, we put $2.1 billion into repairing those buildings. We put another $1.6 billion into the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, no mayor ever did anything like that before. Look, the bottom line here is uh, NYCHA, the, all public housing around the country, was built with federal support with the assumption of ongoing federal support. It was built in a way that there was no way cities could appropriately support it. And then the federal government started walking away, not yesterday, but back in 1980 when Ronald Reagan got elected. So we're talking now, you know, we're going to be in our fourth decade soon of disinvestment in public housing. That's really bad news. Uh, it means for New York City, uh, the price tag now probably well over $20 billion of repairs and maintenance that need to happen that we don't have the money for. But the good news is we still have public housing. It hasn't been privatized. It hasn't been torn down like in a lot of other cities around the country. It's a, it's a, you know, a real gem in the sense that it is preserved, protected, affordable housing for people who need it in this city. We got to keep investing a lot more. Now, I think the state of New York could help us. They actually allocated already $250 million over the last few budgets and then didn't give us the money. So the hypocrisy is the governor's getting his photo op, but not handing over the money. I mean, I say, put your money where your mouth is. Give us the money you already owe us. Also, I've spent a whole lot of time 
in public housing buildings. Uh, throughout my entire life in public service, I go to buildings all the time. I talk to residents. I've walked the hallways. I've been up and down the stairways. Things have been a long, long time since the governor showed up in a public housing building, which strikes me as a rather a political opportunistic act. Uh, let's just get back to <laughs> you know, the shade these two <laughs> kick- <laughs> a political opportunist, opportunistic act. The shade. You I thought that was very polite. <laughs> yeah, it was paid on the low. I cleaned it up for your show. <laughs> you you know, don't have to though. Don't don't, don't, don't clean it up for this show. I know you want me to be very proper I, here. I, I, I heard him. No, I, I mean I heard him. I heard him go off on you about how long you, you thought it would take to replace Rikers Island, and it wasn't being really progressive. By the way, I, I, I want to make sure there's not been a misunderstanding. I was told by a Nissan on my team this was Christian family programming <laughs> and that I should not use any curse words or anything like that. That's right. what I was told. No, no, no. Well, yes. you're the mayor, so you can't, yes. you can't say shit. I think there's like been that. a misunderstanding. It was M&M station. <laughs> oh, that's down the hall? Okay. <laughs> but but, but you, you feel like that was just a photo op for Oh, him. come on. It's, yeah. you know, again, it's real simple. Federal government and state government, I say the same thing. Yeah. say the same thing about Donald Trump as I'd say about Andrew Cuomo. If you want to help, it's really easy. Mm-hmm. Uh, pick up the phone and say, how can I help? Uh, the number one thing we need is resources. If we're, if we're over $20 billion in the hole, and we're putting in our own money. I told you, $2.1 billion, $1.6 billion, that's $3.7 billion right there in just the last four years. We're putting in our own money. Come help us. Don't criticize, don't undercut, don't act like, you know, it happened because of something recently. It didn't. It's been going on for decades. Mm -hmm. Try and help. But I don't have the illusion that either the federal government or certainly the executive branch at the state level are going to try and find a way to help. Now, the legislature, I want to be fair, the the assembly has been fantastic. The state assembly led by Speaker Carl Hastie have been very focused on the needs of public housing. They've been fighting for more resources for in a way to actually give us the ability to get something done. That's what we should focus on. Um, Section of City Star and activist Cynthia Nixon announced her plans to run for governor. That's a friend of yours, right? Indeed. Okay. Um, I think she was an activist first. Is only activist first. Okay, activist first. Beautiful person. How about that? Um, Would you endorse her? Look, I've said to everyone who asks uh, a couple of things. One, I'm not making any statements about. Uh, what I'm going to do in this election year, 2018, in the state of New York. I'm not doing that right now. We'll do that down the line. Okay. I have said I believe we need a Democratic state Senate majority because something very artificial is happening that's propping up the Republicans in Albany, and that needs to change. But on the specific endorsements, that'll come another day. Mayor de Blasio, this is what I'm going to do, man. We're going to play some music. And then we're going to come back and continue the conversation. I look forward to that. All right. 888-742-3345. Ask them anything, man. Because I'm Curtis Blow, and I want you to know that. Mayor Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York City, is here. Listen to that percussion. That's a classic. That's a modern classic. Classic. Curtis Blow, by request by Mayor de Blasio. Uh, We've been covering a lot of topics here. And uh, we got a few more we want to cover. We got some folks on the line. Jenna's on the line from South Carolina. Hi, Jenna. Good morning, Jenna. 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 You might need your headphones for this, Mayor. How y'all doing? How y'all doing? How's everybody? How's that? Doing great, man. We got Mayor de Blasio in here, Jenna. Come on now. Come on. Hey, how you doing, Mayor? How you doing? Hey, Jenna. Uh, it's Jennifer, but that's okay. Um, no, you guys were just uh, talking about a topic that like, really touched me um, in regards to the opium epidemic. Yes. Can you turn so, the radio okay. down, too? Jen- Jenna, turn your radio down for me. I think it's my phone because I don't have the radio. Okay. What's Do you a- think it's the speaker phone? It's the speaker. speaker Pick phone. it up. Yeah. Pick it up. Okay. Hello? Is it, is it better now? Yes. There you go. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So last year, um, March 15th, I lost my father mm. um, to actually an overdose of heroin. The person that gave it to him, they basically played Russian roulette. You know, they, you know, he sent somebody to get it and they had three bags and they were like, oh, give him one of these has fentanyl in it. Let him chew. So they took it to him and he died. So my thing is, we're talking about real quick, a little bit of background. My dad was a wonderful man. He worked for a lawyer for over 35 years. And, he, you know, it's just not like every addict is a bad person. But he got hurt. He was actually born and raised from Brooklyn. And in Brooklyn, he got jumped by gang members. I mean, they beat him basically almost till he was dead. Uh-huh. He was like 21. 
And um, so he couldn't get help through disability. Finally, he did. And through that, they were just giving him medication his entire life. Um, when he moved upstate New York, the, the doctor, one of the doctors that he was seeing actually OD'd himself. Well, he, he committed suicide mm. wow, because, sucks. as it turned out, he was going to jail for giving all these medications out. So, so, so Jenna, I, uh, what's, what's your question for the mayor? Well, my thing is, I mean, do you really think there's gonna, it's going to be successful as far as helping people, you know, yes. getting that epidemic stopped? Yeah, yeah, Jennifer, I want you to know there, there's been... Um, too many people lost because there was no sincere effort to show them that they could get help. And I think we know there's been a massive stigma on addiction in this country. And we know everything from family members who have shunned their loved ones who were addicts and people at work and people in community who, rather than reach out a helping hand, have turned away. And we need to break that stigma. That is what my wife, Charlene, has been particularly focused on here in New York City. Break that stigma first. Get the communication going. And then make the treatment and help very readily available. So in New York City, you call a single phone number. You get a trained counselor. They connect you to the help. There's no stigma. There's no shame. It is part of the human condition. But I think what's happened for so many people is they felt hopeless. They didn't have a place to turn. Uh, they didn't have anyone they could talk to. There was not a way to navigate like, where they could find the help. And we've lost a huge number of people with that. One of the things we're doing here in the city, I think, could be uh, replicated all over the country. And, and my wife, Charlene, has an organization called Cities Thrive, which is uh, cities all over the country are committed to addressing mental health differently. And what we are encouraging uh, cities to do is do what we call Weekends of Faith, where in houses of worship of all backgrounds, uh, the clergy talk about mental health openly, encourage people to come forward, encourage them to get help. Uh, Shirlane's also doing a great, great effort around the country with uh, African-American sororities uh, that are doing great work now, focusing on outreach throughout communities to let people know they can get help, they should not feel alone. Mm -hmm. That is the beginning of the change. Mm -hmm. Jen Jenna, thank you for your call and sharing that story with us. You're a citizen. It's the morning. Charles, uh, we're going to do quick questions. What's your question for hey, Mayor Charles. de Blasio, Charles? It's Charles, y'all. Charles. Charles. What up, Charles? <laughs> What's up? What's up? Go ahead, Charles. Hey, I just actually, um, I don't know if you guys hit on this, but I wanted to know what Mayor de Blasio thought about President Trump pushing a death penalty on drug dealers instead of like murderers and killers, but drug dealers first. Yeah, Charles, you know, a couple of things. First of all, I don't believe in the death penalty. I don't believe in it morally. I don't believe it's a deterrent to crime. I, I think this is like Donald Trump once again, you know, going back to the 1970s and 80s and trying to use a quote-unquote tough-on-crime divisive approach. And it doesn't work. It didn't work then. It doesn't work now. The fact is that we want to get to the root of this crisis. Again, it's about educating people. It's about opening up communication, destigmatizing. Yeah, we got to go at people who uh, deal drugs, but that's not the only piece of the equation. My own police commissioner here says you can't arrest your way out of the opioid crisis. Mm. It also has to be about treatment. It has to be about prevention. There's many more layers to this if we're going to actually defeat it. All right. Hey, thanks for your call, Charles. Mayor de Blasio is here, um, and we're talking about um, him and the, the city council reached an agree agreement to replace Rikers Island jails with community-based facilities. That's what we started off with, but yep. we're, we're starting to get into some other avenues. Mike Muse is here. The illustrious Mike Muse. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. It's good to see you, Mr. Mayor. It's good uh, to see you. By the way, Mike Muse was, was with me from the very beginning when I started out, and I was not the front runner in 2013. Mike Muse was with me. That's what I needed to win. Well, he yeah, told me yeah. he, he was with you when you were broke. <laughs> yes. And then he helped you make money, and now here you are. That is exactly, <laughs> Sway, that's exactly what happened. Okay, I get it. I call it the Muse effect. Yeah. Okay. Hey. Yeah. Wow, thank you, for, thank you for that, Mr. Factor. Mayor. Uh, which is good to have you here because I think yeah. a lot of times, just in your conversation you've been having so far, a lot of people don't get a chance to hear your constitution on why you do the decisions that you make and yeah. why you create the policies that you have. The reason I'm excited that to have you here, besides just uh, respecting your brand of politics, was on our show we always talk about national issues and the national agenda. Yeah. But I'll always say that the local action of politics is really where it's how you make change, right? right? And we can be so frustrated with our national news and national policies, not understanding how locally we can make that difference. And so you being here is such a great case 
case study of that in play right now. And you're talking about, so two things I want to ask you, but first I want to talk about this ecosystem of what we're talking about right now. You talked about the ecosystem of mental health. Yeah. You talked about Thrive NYC, right? You talk about the social services within NYCHA and the housing. Yeah. You talk about the attempt to close down Rikers Island. That's a whole ecosystem that lends someone as a destination to Rikers Island if they don't have the housing, the social services, and the mental health in place. What about affordable housing? Uh, you know, you've been very aggressive in making sure New York City has affordable housing, yeah. but affordable housing is an issue across the board in other local cities too as well. Sure. What is the importance of affordable housing to make sure that the individuals have how it plays into mental health and then how it plays into not ending in that road of criminal justice? Well, Mike, I appreciate that question. So I just want to frame it real quick. You're absolutely right. The local level is where we can make immense change right now. It doesn't matter if Donald Trump's in the White House. We can make change right now and it's happening all over the country. And that will build a pathway to bigger changes nationally. Uh, look, it's also true, and your question gets to it. Our society is kind of backwards. We end up, and we've been the, the, the number one mass incarcerator on earth, the United States of America. Mm. We focus at punishing people at the back end rather than addressing their needs at the front end. And so it's affordable housing, it's education, it's fighting poverty, it's creating job opportunities. All the things that would build a healthy society with maximum uh, buy-in by people, maximum opportunity, we don't do that. Mm. Uh, one of the things I'm proudest of in New York City, and you've been involved in this too, is we created a universal pre-K program in New York City. Every single four-year-old gets quality early child education for free in New York City. That's 70,000 kids. Mm. And now we're going to give that same right to three-year-olds. In the next th four years, we're going to make that a universal right in New York City. Now, the reason I say that, and I'll, I'll get to affordable housing, but I want to say this. If you think about every three-year-old, every four-year-old, Equal opportunity, doesn't matter if you're wealthy or low income, you get a quality education from the very beginning of your intellectual development. That's going to change the long-term trajectory. That is where you actually go at root causes. Mm -hmm. And we know that it's real clear research. Give children quality education early in life. They will not end up in jail. They will end up on a very positive path. Affordable housing, obviously a big part of the equation. One of the things we've done here is we've stopped uh, letting landlords evict people without any consequence. So now in New York City, this is something that could happen all over the country. I've talked to other mayors about it. They're excited. We give lawyers for free to anyone facing eviction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We say, if you're going to be evicted, we think it might be illegal. We give you a lawyer to help you stop the eviction. That is morally right, but also saves that family from being homeless. Mm -hmm. It keeps them in affordable housing. It's one of the smartest investments we can make. We're also requiring developers to build affordable housing. When a developer needs to come to New York City for permission to build something taller or bigger than what is allowed currently, mm -hmm. we say, well, you can do that, but you have to give us 25% affordable housing or 30% affordable housing mm -hmm. for the community. If you're not willing to do that, you can't build the way you want to. Other cities are starting to pick up on that. Use your power. Use your local power. We get to determine the rules of yes. engagement, right? Yep. We need to demand more on behalf of the people. Yeah. And speaking of, we have a lot of, you mentioned education, a lot of our citizens who call up are teachers. Yes. We have a huge percent of the population who are educators who tweet me all the time after our political discourse and talk about how it informs them in terms of their classroom instructions. With our current national system, our new secretary, Betsy DeVos, who comes from the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, she has a very progressive agenda when it comes to charter schools. I know in New York City, we're onboarding. It depends on how you define the word progressive in this case. Well, she well, has I, 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 aggressive. An aggressive, aggressive. An aggressive, yeah. She has an aggressive agenda school. regarding charter schools. I know New York City is onboarding a new chancellor of our school yes. system right now. How are you seeing that in play in terms of locally, in terms of what's happening nationally in the conversation of charter versus public school, yeah. how it's affecting on the local level? Well, first of all, I'm very excited to have uh, our new chancellor come on board, Richard Carranza, who is a very progressive educator. I think he's going to be a major, major uh, difference maker in this city. Um, but let me just say something about what's happening locally on education around the country, because we have to see teachers, to their great credit, are rising up around the country and demanding their rights to you know, decent funding for their schools and decent treatment as teachers. You saw it in West Virginia. This is another reason why I tell people we're in a blessed time in terms of social and political change in this country. Don't look at the White House. Look at the grassroots. Uh -huh. West Virginia, no one saw that coming. Yeah. It's a very, very tough state. Uh, to organize in. There's no even uh, collective bargaining rights for labor, but the teachers just rose up as a wildcat strike and they won. Now it's starting to happen in Oklahoma. Yeah. So not the places that you expect 
uh, big progressive movements to happen, they're happening anyway. Something big is happening in this country, and, and teachers are helping to lead the way. But I'd say to you, uh, in terms of uh, the charter schools and the overall agenda, look, the backbone of American education is traditional public schools. In fact, in many parts of the country, it's the only kind of school there is. Um, we need to recognize that rather than uh, defund traditional public schools or run away from them or pu uh, punish them. Let's double down on making them great. One of the most important things, as I said, is focus on early childhood education. Give every kid a strong start. They can thrive in school. We work with charter schools, but we have a clear sense of values here in the city. A charter school that's working with every kind of child, like a traditional public school we will work with, will be supportive and helpful. But if you're a charter school that excludes kids with disabilities or excludes English language learners, or here's my least favorite of what they do, you get a kid into your school and then you find they're not good at taking tests, so you kick them out before test taking time, yeah. that's obscene. And uh, I always say traditional public schools, we take everyone. We're here to serve everyone. It doesn't matter if you are, are gifted or not. We're here to serve you and make you all you can be. So that's my standard on charters, but there are some charters that really do try and reach everyone and those we want to work with. All right. Tracy G., you got a quick question? Yes. Mayor de Blasio, New York City is plastered of conversations about gentrification. Yes. What are your thoughts for um, those who feel like communities are being drained of culture just so yeah. we conform to middle class taste? Tracy, that is a huge issue. I appreciate it. I, look, first of all, the best way to combat the negatives of gentrification, I mean, you could argue the bigger phenomenon, whatever pros and cons, but let's acknowledge the negatives. How do we combat that? Uh, protecting affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So I said, the, the numbers in New York City are actually staggering. 400,000 people in public housing. That's guaranteed that's going to be public forever, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we've got over 2 million people who have their rent levels protected through what's called rent stabilization. So they cannot get a rent increase unless a New York City board approves it. And in fact, uh, two times in my administration, we did a rent freeze. We literally said there should not be any additional rent for that uh, year uh, because of the facts before us. So those tenants are protected in affordable housing. All the folks we're helping to stop eviction, you know, helping to protect them from eviction by giving them a free lawyer. And we're in the middle of an initiative here to create 300,000 affordable apartments, either brand new or by subsidizing people in the community. So for example, you take a community that's suffering from gentrification like Harlem. Mm -hmm. We're going into uh, the community, we're finding literally thousands of people who we provide a rent subsidy to so they can stay in their exact apartment long term. It's typically 20, 30 years or more. So these are the tools to create balance. If people can stay in their own community, their culture is protected. We also believe on the pure cultural level, uh, we have a strategy in terms of cultural institutions. We provide support, not just for the big, you know, fancy uh, Manhattan-based organizations. God bless them. They do good work too. But for a lot of community-based uh, organizations, particularly in communities of color, that used to not get government funding, but are grassroots cultural organizations. That's part of everything that makes New York City great, too. We think they deserve support directly from the city government as well. Thank you. Mayor de Blasio, Heather, you got one for him? Yeah, because I think that no matter where you live, you touched on so many heavy things, but I think for no matter where you are in this country, school shootings have yeah. just been making everyone just tense. What are your What's your take on it, your thoughts on what's happening, and maybe a prevention solution? Well, let's, let's separate the, the question of how we protect kids here and now versus the changes we have to make. So on the first point, you know, what we have learned is communication is the way to prevent these tragedies. And we saw, I'm not going to editorialize on what happened in Parkland, but there clearly was some information there that, that could have been handled differently. Right. Um, what we emphasize is just like neighborhood policing, I mentioned to you officers now learning the names of community residents, saying good morning, giving them their cell phone, giving them their email. We want that to happen across the board, not just NYPD patrol officers, but our school safety agents too. And a lot of times those relationships with students, with parents, with teachers yield the information that allows us to stop something before it might get bad. Uh, it's also about mental health. Let's face it, a lot of these shooters, uh, the one in Newtown, Connecticut, and obviously in Parkland, Florida, these were, in each case, younger people who had shown the signs of mental health disorders years and years earlier. Uh -huh. If you have an aggressive process to make sure people can get connected to mental health services. In fact, now every school in New York City has connection to mental health services so that if a teacher sees something, 
you can actually do something about early on. The earlier, the better. Mm -hmm. My wife, Charlene, told me a statistic that made my blood run cold. Typical American that goes 10 years between the time their mental health condition manifests and the time they get formal treatment. Wow. 10 years. Yeah. That's what we can act on, and we can change the trajectory for so many people. But the second piece of the equation is the, the fundamental change in our laws that's needed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the uh, NRA uh, blockade on change is finally breaking down. I think their power is slipping. I think the students in Florida have now changed the equation. And then we saw around the country, the estimate is almost a million kids walked out mm -hmm. on the day with memorializing those lost in Florida. Uh, we in New York City said we're going to respect that movement. We did not in any way try and inhibit it. We tried to make clear that those were young people were doing something that their elders did not manage to yeah. achieve. Yeah. And I think that's very hopeful because mm -hmm. if that movement continues to grow and there's going to be a big march uh, on Saturday in Washington, uh, I think it's one of the things that will be a difference maker going forward in terms of real change, just common sense gun safety legislation that will save a lot of lives. Mayor de Blasio, man. Thank you, Thank bro. Thank you. So we, we won't see teachers with guns in the classroom? No, not sir. Not in New York City? And not in New York City. By the okay. way, the vast majority of teachers in the country, the surveys show it, no. do not want guns. They don't want to hold them, and they don't want them in their buildings. Okay, Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming up here. you got to come back. I would be yeah, honored. Good. You enjoy yourself? I, does it get better than this? I don't think so. <laughs> it's, it's all downhill from I, here, I'll tell you something. I've been, on, I've been on all sorts of famous TV shows, mm -hmm. radio shows. No one else played Curtis Blow. <laughs> that, that proves, yeah, man. Sway, yeah. you are... You're the ultimate. Thank you, Mayor. You're the ultimate. Thank you, Mayor de Blasio. Coming from you, man. I appreciate it, man. And your Curtis Blow knowledge. That's pretty that's, deep, man. That's pretty good. That's deep and you indeed. shouted out Grandmaster Flash, too. I get it. And the Furious Five. And Don't the forget the Furious up, Five. Up, 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 up. <laughs> Mayor Bill de Blasio, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming through. It's Sway in the Morning. Only on Shade 45.